Good morning. Welcome to the Opie and Anthony Show. Kind of uh, embarrassed that we're playing that uh, that shock jock intro as Buzz Aldrin makes his way to the Opie and Anthony Show. I know. Right off the bat, we're going to be interviewing Buzz Aldrin. Uh, he's got, what, uh, a new film out? Fly Me to the Moon, right? Very, very cool. Opening August 15th. Also, BuzzAldrin.com. Wow, there he is. An American hero. Coming into the Opie and Anthony special couch. Steve made him sit on the couch. He was going, Steve, he can sit wherever he wants. Well, right. I just, we just thought you'd be comfortable on the couch, uh, Mr. Aldrin. <laughs> no. What do he say? We're ganging, up, ganging up on him. No bows. What do we got? We got garbage headphones got for Buzz Aldrin. Triple A battery. Uh, yeah. You need a triple A battery? Yeah. You know the Bose uh, headset. Right, right. All those yeah. things Push are. Button to turn it red. Yeah. Those are yeah. great. Those are awesome. You get on a plane, you don't have to listen. Yeah. You, you have know, them for travel? You don't have to listen to people and hey, you're noise. Clear, yeah. yeah. How loud was that uh how loud was that Apollo eleven taking off? That'd be pretty loud, right? <laughs> we didn't hear it all that much. Really? No, we had a headset on and we're uh, upstairs at the Anytime you watch dramatizations of it, like on films, because I like uh what'd you think of Apollo thirteen, the uh the film, Ron Howard's film? It was a uh, made-for-story drama. Oh, really? You, you knew what the outcome was, but oh, well, that's true. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but but the the thing is, the uh, the launch always uh, it seems very violent in movies. Uh, was it like that? Were you really shaken well, up? Movies make it look like violent. Yeah. Yeah. That's the name of the game. You gotta, you gotta shake. Rattle, yeah, yeah. Rattle and roll. You guys know that. Over dramatize a little yeah. bit, but was it was it a, a shaky ride going up or? Uh... It, there's a difference of opinion depending on who you talk to. I thought it was quite smooth. Really? Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I, I look at the films of people in in the, the shuttle where it's shaking all around. Mm -hmm. I, I just see anything like that really yeah. <laughs> because it's all relative yeah because he's a man's man if it was jimmy he would say well, yeah it was what, shaking what, like an earthquake the, the argument that i put forth is that the three of us agreed in some little conversation that we had that we felt at the instant of liftoff or that that we were no longer attached to the ground mm -hmm. okay now that's pretty sensitive feel as as if the the rockets were you know, gimbling a little bit mm -hmm. to uh, keep us on course. Well, if you look at uh, the film, slow motion of that rocket going up and, and see the, the rocket bells, they're not moving a fraction of an inch. No. <clears throat> but anyway, we had that sensation. Now, if you were shaking like this, you could never come to that conclusion. Right. Uh, <laughs> that the moment of liftoff was uh, uh, just really imperceptible and, uh, and it uh, was so smooth that you felt like there was a little steering of the rocket going on. That's amazing. Buzz, what determined who... How do I put a hole in this damn thing? Steve, please, sip some coffee. Stop bothering him. Steve. <laughs> We're trying to... Give... Want me to help him? No, why would he? He went to the moon. He doesn't need some help. <laughs> he doesn't need Steve helping. I'll help get your coffee cup open. You ever felt like you're helped to death? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, I think he can handle it. <laughs> he said, "That's all right, big boy." <laughs> Buzz, what determined um, with, uh, with the painted uh, extremities? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, did, what determined which one of the three of you went actually first? Was there anything that uh, I mean? Was it was it was it because was Neil considered the mission leader or what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Were you ever, we were tempted to just go out of hell with it and kind of bump him out of the way. <laughs> I'm a military guy, you know. I. I know how to take orders. That's what you learn the first couple of days being a plebe. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. No, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we like to think you did rock, paper, scissors to see who <laughs> went first. <laughs> now, the uh, when I, when I uh, listen back to uh, some of the historical uh, tapes and stuff, uh, there, was, there was a little problem uh, with the landing as far as uh, finding a spot to land. And as time goes on now, you realize how critical that was. Uh, what, what were you guys thinking when, when um, apparently Neil Armstrong was and and yourself were were trying to find a landing spot for this thing, running out of fuel quickly? Well, the computer was doing its job. It was gonna it was gonna land, 
uh, itself. Mm -hmm. But nobody wanted to let the computer land in the wrong spot. Right. It, it couldn't see all the little uh, uh, little craters here and there. And right, right. Rocks. Cut you down, and then you tip over. Uh, uh, so it, it was sort of an accepted uh, agreement among all the commanders that they were going to manually take over uh, at 500 feet. Now, when I say manually take over, that, that means you're steering the autopilot. You're, you're giving it kind of additional instructions as, mm -hmm. as to what to do and, and how to steer it. <clears throat> and then it smooths things out and uh, <clears throat> digests them. And <clears throat> so you uh, can, can take over and, and get the feel, the response, uh, and then sort of guide it to where you want to go. And we practiced in helicopters uh, doing this, and then we had a monstrous uh, trainer called uh, LLTV, Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. <clears throat> it was a research vehicle at first, and uh, they, they didn't research it all that well. Oh, is that the one? Uh, several guys had to bail out of it. You checked uh, out, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it it uh, didn't have wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so if the engine quit or something, it was coming down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or if it lost control. So you guys had uh, barely any fuel left uh, when when you touched down? Was it was it that close? Yeah, well, uh, early spacecraft are always a little heavier than, than later ones. Mm. And uh, a heavier one requires more fuel to change its uh, velocity and, and movement. Sure. So it's consuming more fuel as it, as it comes on down to make a landing. And uh, probably... Uh, we were nominally scheduled to have maybe a minute and a half, <clears throat> maybe two minutes of fuel left at the normal time of touchdown. <clears throat> but we were clearly a little bit long from the starting point, and if yeah. you're long, that means you're burning fuel longer, uh, and uh, time time is fuel being used. So sure. we were going to be consuming automatically a little bit more, and then what uh, Neil saw... He sort of redesignated to a little longer place, and then with something in front of you that you don't want to land at, <laughs> there are kind of four things you can do as you're coming down like this. If you want to land short, you got to pitch up to slow down, and you'll have to lose sight of where you're going. Mm -hmm. And if you want to land to the left, you go this way, and then you got to do this way, and it's kind of drastic either way. The best thing to do is just nose forward. And, and fly over and then land over here. <laughs> that takes longer, conserves more fuel. Therefore, you guys talking to each other during this point and saying, uh, calling out fuel, or is there? Yeah, I, well, are you going, hey, the, uh, gauge wasn't yeah. all, the gauge wasn't all that good. It had a light on it. <laughs> oh, and, God. Uh, supposedly... It's like an old Pontiac. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little better than that. Well, yeah, a little better. <laughs> a light on it. So, at six, uh, at a calculated 60 seconds. Of, of fuel remaining and then the guys on the ground could watch much closer the digital readouts being radioed back mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they called out 60 seconds to let us know that that's how much time we had like, we we're still 100 feet in the air oh, wow <laughs> no that's wrong we weren't we weren't in the air we yeah in you're the in air. above we the surface the ground, yeah Wow. wow! What were you thinking as you, as you come down? I mean, you you're, you're landing <clears> on the moon. What's kind of going through your head as you you're the first people to to ever do this? Um, we're not really conscious of what's going through our head. We're responding sort of automatically, uh, as if uh, you're in a helicopter or a lunar landing training vehicle. As long as it looks okay, you you. Keep going with what's okay. <laughs> you're all right. If yeah. it doesn't look okay, then you start uh, doing something about it. So, so you're not dreaming or conscious of what's going through your head. Just doing your your job at that point, I, I would gather. When did it hit you? Then you're right. Like that's you're probably looking at all the facts and making sure everything is working. When did it actually hit you? Like, wow, I'm 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 on the moon. I mean, like, when did that like emotion hit you as opposed to just the the facts of doing what you were doing? All the way. Uh, you're, you're always conscious of what it is you're doing. And when there's nothing left to do, then you can relax. And uh, when we uh, shut the engine off, when I saw the light come on, which means contact uh, with the surface, there were about six-foot probes extending down from the landing gear pad. 
and obviously when you land, those are going to be bent sideways, uh, and that throws a micro switch, which turns the light on in the cockpit, saying that you have just touched the ground. Uh, so when that happens, you shut the engine off. So in case Neil didn't see the light and is concentrating, why I called out uh, contact light, engine stop, um, and a few other things. So you, you could very easily touch down, and the computer may not really know that you touched down. It just knows that it something uh, unusual is happening, <laughs> and it's maybe not in the last attitude that, that it was supposed to be, so it's going to fire thrusters to, to get it in the right attitude, but it can't do that because it's on the ground. Even so, though you're on the ground, so, right. So you got to tell it, I'm on the ground, and you tap the controller to do that. You, you understand that. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, kind of kind of do. <laughs> was there a point while you guys were on the moon, where and Michael Collins is in the... Uh, in, in the ship, was there a point where where you get nervous? Like, all right, well, Michael Collins is up there waiting for us, but what if he screws up? And uh, was there a, 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 any fear of getting stranded? I mean, that's kind of where my head probably would have been at. Uh, was there like a little thought that like there, something there goes are wrong? Planning, planning thoughts where you're conscious of what's going on, uh, but n but not during the the act. It's a little late to be worried about things like that. Yeah, yeah, you're I'm, there. I guess I'm treating it like it's a family vacation instead of a military mission. But. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, yeah, because because I I was wondering uh, about the uh, the booster that takes you back up now to the command module. Uh, the you know, you're wondering if that's going to fire uh, at some point. It, that has to cross so you your mind. You, like you don't want it to fire until you want it to fire. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you don't want to be walking around and watch it uh, take off. That's for sure. But you also do want it to fire when you're you're in there ready to leave. Uh, that that had to cross your mind too at some point. No. No. That that's it's amazing. It, that's engineering that, faith. Engineering faith. Yeah. Faith in Grumman. Oh, right. <laughs> that's amazing. That is Just, amazing. Uh, out the road a piece. Yep. There's a museum out uh, there somewhere, Cradle of Aviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking to get them involved uh, <clears throat> in a uh, 40th anniversary uh, next April <clears throat> for two combined missions because they were pretty close together mm -hmm. of Apollo 9 and 10 because they both involved the lunar module. Uh, <clears throat> Apollo 9 was in Earth orbit, the first flight uh, of the landing craft in Apollo 10. Uh, we took the lander uh, on the dress rehearsal to mm -hmm. the moon. So I want to have a reunion uh, of, of the guys involved uh, at about that time. Well, uh, you, ever, you ever heard of Yuri's Night? Yuri's Night, no. You know who Yuri is? I would guess, uh, <laughs> yeah, Yuri, um, what's his Gagarin. last name? Gagarin. 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 Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, some, uh, some neat kids uh, felt that the U.S. needed to uh, lead the world in celebrating the first guy who went into orbit. Yuri Gagarin. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know why the U.S. has to celebrate uh, <laughs> yeah. somebody else uh, that we were in a race with. <clears throat> so anyway, there's a kind of a social event, uh, April 12th every year, called Yuri's Night. Well, after a while, I kind of resent this. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a, a shepherd's night. Right. Or a yeah. shepherd or a Glenn night. Uh, Glenn gets enough credit uh, these days anyway. He wants to keep flying the shuttle. Yeah, he wants to keep so, so I'm trying to uh, uh, put forth a change to that, making it Yuri Al John's night. Yuri Al John. That's kind of hard to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roll off the tongue. <laughs> the uh, uh, I, I, I obviously know about your um, your love for the skeptics that uh, suggest that. Uh, of course, none of this ever happened. Um, well, I am a skeptic. I, well, I, I would... skeptic of Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are in a way. Uh, these, these skeptics that, that uh, say that this never happened, um, uh, I can't even believe that they uh, come out with stuff like this. But you obviously they have get, been outspoken. Why, why, do you, uh, why are you interested in it? Because it's controversy. That's what your shows are built on. Hey, what's uh, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? Let's fix it. Right I can't now. stand those people because uh, it's 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 denial. It's some it's kind of a do is ignore. Ignore. Uh, you're just feeding into their their routine. Well, I kind of remember one guy you didn't yeah, quite ignore, that, <laughs> but that, that was I nice. Hate to say this, but I would hate to be taken in by a bunch of crackpots mm -hmm. and, and enhance their purposes. 
<clears throat> by uh, uh, feeding into their business of calling attention to them. That's what, that's what they want. Well, I got to tell you, when 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 you kind of popped that guy, uh, I was very proud. That was a proud moment right there. What are you pointing at there, Buzz? A little bit of a wreck. The hazardous world here. <laughs> the hazardous world. Hey, you know what's going on in about uh, 45 minutes? What's that? Quietly, stealthily, the moon is going to get between the sun and the earth. It's called an, an eclipse. An eclipse. Yeah. yeah. That's happening today? Today. Today. Yeah. today and it's yeah. visible uh, where? Seven. seven uh, is it visible here? <clears throat> yeah, on the, on the TV set. <laughs> on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because... No, it kind of kind of sweeps across uh, Asia, uh, Nor Canada, North America, and and on into Russia. Uh, Where it's kind of dark. And there was a time when I thought, well, I think I'll go to Russia and look at this thing. And Lois said, no, that's not too good an idea. <laughs> then somebody invited me up to a, a simulated Mars uh, location in Canada. It's called Devon Island, where there's a crater. And uh, a lot of things there look as if you're uh, maybe on the Martian surface. <clears throat> so NASA and other people are using that as sort of a simulated training place. And they have a, a, a habitat that's landed. And there are a bunch of guys that go up there in the summer. And uh, they kind of camp out uh, for a while. You've been a strong advocate of uh, going to Mars. I've read uh, some of your stuff in Popular Mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we need to do that uh in a deliberate way, mm -hmm. uh, Popular Mechanics. Yeah, I'm having dinner with those guys tonight. Yeah, but uh, they did a nice story uh, oh, about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. on uh, a concept that I came up with, just trying to improve uh, and admire people who are able to bring about change. When uh, Kennedy said. On May 25th, I believe that this nation should commit itself to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. <clears throat> we like that last part of the phrase. <laughs> 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 but but anyway, did we know how to get to the moon, really, at that point? No. Well, we uh, had just had Alan Shepard go up and come down. Mm -hmm. Suborbital, you know, Richard Branson type stuff. Not even in the space like That's Gary Gagarin. That's a far cry Gary from... Went one orbit, yeah. <clears throat> and then he... Uh, uh, opened the hatch and bailed out. Uh, um, the, the, the world didn't know that he jumped out of his spacecraft <laughs> because in order to actually qualify <clears throat> for the uh, uh, the awards, uh, the FAA or the, the French uh, equivalent of awards for achievements in aviation, you got to stay with the craft all the way till it touches down. You don't <laughs> abandon it. Uh, so they, they were a little quiet the russians were about announcing that uh on the way down uh he, he didn't want to land with with the craft yeah uh, so he opened the hatch and jumped out and used a parachute wow. really basically a girl who abandoned ship well those, the, ship. the russians really they well, didn't uh, anyway, they didn't anyway, splash down you know they hit the ground uh, all right so so what i was saying was that uh, <clears throat> uh we didn't really know how to get to the moon. We had a Mercury with one person in it, and we knew that going to the moon it was going to take more than that. So we just automatically filled the gap between those two programs with a program called uh, Gemini. Mm -hmm. And that's what NASA people call it. The astronomers call it Gemini. Uh, but, you know, NASA people have to be different. <laughs> so when, when I explain something about the, the Gemini program, uh, I, I'm always conscious that is the guy going to know what I'm talking about? Gemini, Gemini. Uh, but anyway, it's a two-man program, and it was just smooth and natural as could be. Uh, in contrast to what's what went on after the Apollo program, <clears throat> and what's going on today. Now, when Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon, do we know how to get there? Well, sort of. We had a big, giant rock rocket on paper. While we were building the Saturn V or designing it, uh, there was an even bigger rocket. And if we'd gone that way to go to the moon direct, turn around and come back, <clears throat> we probably wouldn't have made it uh, until 1975 or something like that. Then there was the Saturn V. We could use two of them and join things up in uh, Earth orbit and then go to the moon, land, come back. Uh, and Werner von Braun was in favor of that. Uh, it used his rocket twice. And the science advisor to the president thought that's, that's the way to do it. <clears throat> and then there was this... Uh, engineer, 
uh, at Langley, uh, NASA Langley, who said, wait, wait a minute, I think there's a better way to do that. We can use only one Saturn V. Man, that, that's a pretty good idea. But we have two spacecraft, and we're going to send those two spacecraft to the moon. When they get to the moon, uh, two guys are going to get in one of them. They're going to land. The other guy's going to stay there. Uh, and then when they get through uh, kicking up dust on the surface, <laughs> they're going to get back in again, and they got to join up with the other craft. Uh, that ain't easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Especially quarter of a million <clears throat> miles away. Uh, but a bodacious plan called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous was proposed. And uh, in around 1961, 1962, after Kennedy committed us to go to the moon, that's what we decided to do. Uh, and von Braun went along with the idea, so did other people. And Gemini was pretty much a practice and, and, and so for, for docking. The point I'm making is that when we decided to do something, we really didn't understand. But we were flexible mm -hmm. back then. We were adjustable. Uh, after we finished Apollo, we, we had a Skylab mission that used Apollo stuff, but we still had almost six years when no American went into space. We had a gap between when we stopped doing one thing and you start doing the next one. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that in uh, uh, after Sputnik between Mercury yeah. and Apollo, and we were flexible early, but we were not flexible when we when we started designing the shuttle. Uh, we made a mistake by uh, thinking we could <clears throat> put two crew members in the booster rocket, and they were ne necessary. I objected to that, but not loud enough, and that was a stupid thing for NASA to do. Uh, but we were NASA was not flexible then to look at the best way to go from the Apollo program to the shuttle program. Mm -hmm. We we had another uh, uh, Skylab, and it's in the Smithsonian. Why the hell didn't we fly it and join it up with the first Skylab? Man, that would have been an even bigger space station. Then we could have flown people to it. We could cram six people in an Apollo command module. We could have done that all through the 70s into the 80s, but we didn't. So why, why didn't they? was smart enough then. That's what I'm saying, that we were not flexible enough to look at alternative things. Now, that leads us to today, right today, after uh, we lost the Columbia accident, lost uh, three guys coming back in, seven guys coming back in to land. <clears throat> uh, we, we only had three left. We had to do something, probably. Now, the uh, that's uh, in, in 2003, the beginning of that, 1st of February. President, the president's got a re-election coming up. Maybe he could just kind of sit tight and do, do nothing. D don't do anything controversial with an election year coming up. Is that what happened? No. Uh, he, he had his people study during the year 2003 so that at the beginning of a crucial second-term election for re-election, first term went to the Supreme Court. What did he do? He made change. Change. Okay? Billion dollars of change program in uh, terminating the shuttle, uh, finishing the space station, and going to the moon again. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. Nobody gives them credit for doing that. That was the vision that came out uh, at the beginning of 2004. Okay, as we have, uh, we, NASA has wanted to implement this program, we got a gap. We're going to stop flying the orbiter in 2010. When is the next spacecraft, Orion, that's going to take people to the moon uh, and bring them back? Uh, that won't be ready till 2015 or beyond. We got a gap. Five years, yeah. Have we fixed the gap? No. Are we flexible about re examining what we're doing? No. We need to do that. That's our problem today. Hmm. That's my problem to try and be a catalyst to, to, to look at the different options. You utilize because that five got, years. We got uh, a, a, an election coming along, and two guys are going to replace the president that put in motion uh, going back to the moon and, and on to Mars. And uh, we don't know what the, either one of them is going to do, but I'm going to try and provide them with a team of uh, very expert people, uh, some of the options that they could uh, they could pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be uh, uh, good to to maybe utilize that five years to do some more research uh, and not just uh, uh, sit there. 
not uh, we 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 can't just sit there. We've got a hundred billion dollars mm-hmm. space station sitting up there, yeah. and our guys want to go up there. You right. know how we're going to have to get up there right now? Russians we're have to hitch a ride with the Russians. Mm. Okay, and, and uh, we can come up with a capsule and land in the ocean after twenty five years of seeing our astronauts come back and land on the runway. Why aren't we developing a spacecraft smaller, much smaller than the shuttle that can take? I don't know why. Hmm. NASA has studied something like that for over eight years, and then they put it on the shelf. And you don't know why? I, Jesus. Well, I, I suspect that uh, that they don't like that kind of a uh, spacecraft. It, it somehow uh, brings into question their decision to use a capsule coming back from the moon. Hmm. And they don't like Air Force rockets. No. Well, that's apparently, that? <laughs> apparently, because uh, there are two very, very good rockets that could be used in addition to uh, deriving things from what the shuttle uh, uh, is launched by uh, uh, rockets and uh, certain engines. We could preserve that, uh, take the orbiter off and uh, and put something on the side and make minimum change hmm. and use that for the cargo, but put the people on, uh, on top of an uh, Air Force rocket that... Uh, that already exists. <clears throat> that that's not all. There's a lot of details involved in in these decisions, but we're not being flexible. I don't believe in reconsidering mm-hmm. before it's too late. If you're proceeding down a course, and clearly a lot of people are beginning to question whether that course, like Yogi Bear says, uh, uh, when there's a fork in the road, take it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I like Yogi because when I moved out of Montclair, New Jersey, he moved in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my! God. I, I, I have a question too. It's a little. It's a different subject, but uh, Doctor uh, Edgar Mitchell, I think his name is, has, mm-hmm. that's right, has been in the news a lot the last few days, um, talking about extraterrestrial and how NASA's covering it up, and the NASA's being very nice about it, but they're saying, well, we we disagree with them. I mean, do you do you know? I'm sure you do know him. I and what's your what's your take on it? Or your little? He's getting a lot of attention. Why? Is his proposition normal? No, it's a little bit bizarre. Uh, people love to pay attention to bizarre things, especially if they involve cover up and conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And that that really attracts attention. You didn't go to the moon? Oh yeah, yeah, you were doing that in the backstage lot in Arizona or something. People pay attention to that. <clears throat> That's what they want. I don't, I don't know what Ed's uh, uh, motives are particularly. Uh, maybe he does have an inside track to intelligent sources who, who claim this and that. Well, so do all the UFO claimers they mm-hmm. have an inside track of information that we don't know about uh, and and it makes them feel important uh, so anybody who says we got a conspiracy going how are you gonna deny a conspiracy you got to prove everything uh, that 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 isn't uh, uh, what they claim yeah well what do you think buzz is there aliens out there I, I, maybe, are we alone maybe we don't know there is no evidence that says there exists life anywhere else in the universe. Ah, is that probable? No, it's very, very probable that you given the right conditions around uh, uh, billions and billions of suns, there's bound to be life that, that will generate itself just naturally, just mm-hmm. like it did uh, here in uh, our solar system uh, on, on the planet Earth. It, it doesn't seem so remarkable a thing. But there's no evidence. Now, we call ourselves in, intelligent, so out of uh, out of all, all that life was teeming around the dinosaurs and everything, things interrupted. Little little big rocks hit the earth, and um, uh, unfortunately, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program, so they couldn't <laughs> stop the, uh, the 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 thing from coming in and, and hitting the earth. Uh, you know, so it gave uh, rise to. Uh, uh, it was okay for the apes to begin to come down from the trees, and they started walking around, and certain branches uh, uh, got, got smart enough to dig in the earth and found some funny stuff that if they uh, got it hot enough, it melted, and they could make that into metal and, and get wires and uh, uh, create radios. And pretty soon they put, down, put together an automobile, a train, an airplane, a spacecraft, a rocket, and went to the moon. That's intelligence. That's pretty amazing. I think it is. Yeah. 
What do you think of technology today? Um, obviously, you've seen a lot of uh, a lot of technology over the years. What do you think? Uh, uh, is it being used wisely? Um, things like the internet, uh, with, with the uh, the way to communicate uh, with anyone in the world at a moment's notice. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You used to know what was underneath the hood of a car. You used to go in and change this thing and that thing. You lift up the hood now, and geez, everything's computer-controlled, and you can't squeeze much of anything mm-hmm. in there. Uh, you got to take it to somebody else to fix fix what's going on. Yeah. Uh, there's no backyard uh, little uh, uh, auto repair shop. Um, and it's amazing. I, I, I got two cell phones. Yeah. Two Blackberries. Uh, and, and the new one's coming out in six months or whatever. Uh, and, and that's a rapid pace of, of innovation that's going on in production. And uh, we, we don't send something back to the repair shop. We throw it away and got a new one when, mm-hmm. when it comes out new. It ain't that way with rockets. It takes a long time to develop a rocket engine and put it through the testing that's needed to get the kind of reliability that we want, that you would want, to climb on top of that rocket and, uh, mm. and, and light the fuse. Most of us in the space program don't really like the word blast off. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit too violent. <laughs> we like lift off. Hey, guys, we got to get Buzz out of here because you're doing uh, Good Morning America or you're going to do some TV, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which one? Because I mean, oh, our listeners... got a few more minutes? Okay. Oh, a few more minutes? Okay, okay cool. good, good. Okay, hey, good. we got an eclipse coming up in 30 minutes, but. You know, <laughs> Where, wherever we, we have to go to Asia. Do you have any? What, what, would you have any motion sickness? I read that there was one of the astronauts that had motion sickness from the time he left, and the other guy just laughed at him because he was vomiting the entire trip. Did you have any any motion sickness? Or anybody you with? If, if you're sitting in a in a combined, uh, co- uh, co- uh, geez, what am I trying to say? A crowded condition, and and you got three guys there, and, and one guy begins to vomit. You're not going to laugh. <laughs> you're going to help clean up what's going on. Uh, and besides that, if, if if you're en route to the moon, somebody's kind of sick, you don't want to turn around and come back. So you tend to downplay what was uh, happening. And uh, Yeah, roughly 50% people sense some uneasiness uh, from dizziness, uh, uh, may, maybe a little... Uh, lack of uh, orientation to to uh, a- actual churning feeling in your stomach to nausea to, to vomiting there uh, and this happens in maybe about 50 percent of people and in, uh, in the early uh, minutes hours day or two of spaceflight and there it's anything? been a it's been a concern uh, not everybody uh, but but once and and it gets kind of complicated and I have my theory about it. I clearly I think that it's visual and psychological. You can sit in a mm. widescreen theater, okay, and see a scene of roller coaster. Right, and right. You feel it in your gut. Yeah. How do you explain that? It's purely you that's know, pure visual. Going on. Uh, you're, you're not churning up your inner ear, mm-hmm. and your vestibular uh, this and that. Uh, so so. Uh, uh, we we don't have the right answer yet, and and I have some theories about it, uh, about people who have a good sense of direction down here, uh, uh, as opposed to some people that don't have a good sense of direction. Those of us that don't have a good sense of direction, we're kind of continually confused when uh, when something changes. So when you get into orbit, for some reason, uh, your reference is taken away from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the person who is kind of egocentric that gets lost down here, uh, up there, uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, it, sure, it's a little different. But the guy who has a great sense of direction, he just lost something that's pretty pretty significant to him. And so he's going to evolve, develop a sensory conflict. And humans with a sensory conflict uh, get uh, nauseous. For some reason, hmm. and if it's sufficiently uh, disturbing, we vomit. What is the closest th- thing to the feeling that, that people just normally on Earth can relate to? Is it like a boat? Is it like when you're just you're going between the Earth and the Moon? Now you're yeah. you're cruising. Uh, what what does that feel like? Is it a rocking motion? Do you? I know that it, yeah. you're you're pretty much well, weightless, there's, but there, there's no uh, there's no up and down. Right, anymore. right. 
uh, when you're at the Earth and we're, and we're oriented with the gravity, uh, that's down. And right. Up. Uh, but when you kind of move away, Buckminster Fuller said, we need to start thinking in terms of outward and inward. We're moving mm. outward, away from the gravity of, of the Earth. Uh, and and that's the sense that you have when you move away and, and the Earth is back there and the moon's over here and the sun's over there. And we're, 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 uh, they're, they're all about in the same plane because of uh, the, the orbital motion of the Earth and, this, and the moon. Uh, and we need to be perpendicular to that plane rotating to even out the heat from the sun mm -hmm. and also to keep communication back to Earth. So uh, you're sitting inside of this thing and... and, and uh, uh, it's moving and the the earth moves by in front of your window and you watch it and then uh, uh, 20 seconds later what well, the moon goes by uh, and then after a while the sun starts streaming in with its brightness there you know it's it, uh, there's no uh, night and day right going out because the sun's there all the time uh, you can look toward the sun and you can't see very many stars because it's too bright mm -hmm. uh, but you look in the other direction, and yes, after a while, your eyes will accommodate, and you can see all the stars you want. Fortunately, because we use those uh, to navigate yeah. our way back home in the event that the deep space tracking network is not giving us information uh, into the computer as to where we are and what we got to do to get back home again. Use the stars. We've gotten and we got the signal. We have to uh, share we, say they have to okay. share the signal. Mm -hmm. We have to. Uh, we have to thank, of course, uh, American legend uh, Buzz Aldrin. We have to also plug what it is you need to plug. There, uh, well, there is a movie going on. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to open up nationwide. Fly me to the moon, right? Fly me to the moon. Yeah, I wish I got residuals on, on something like that. <laughs> Like like Bob Hope, whenever they play, thanks for the memories. He gets paid a little bit because he promotes that. Uh, Fly Me to the Moon is about three flies, flies, that uh, come from a, uh, uh, a a dump or a whatever it is near Cape Canaveral. And, and this colony of flies see these rockets going up all the time. Uh, anyway, the grandpa fly... Uh, tries uh, when he was young to stow away with John Glenn to go into orbit but at the last minute that the pad leader comes up and shushes him away and then closes the hatch so he doesn't get to, to stow away so the the grandson and his two cronies uh, one a geek and one kind of an overweight kid uh, typical of today's kids yeah <laughs> uh, they, they don't they don't listen to their mom about anything uh, they decide that they're going to have an adventure of their own. They're going to stow away in this upcoming flight that's going to go to the moon. So, so they want to go to the moon along with this flight. <clears throat> so they uh, figure a way to stow away on board Apollo 11. And then, of course, something has to go wrong that they fix because they're small little flies. They can go into the uh, inner computer circuits and, and fix some short that, that uh, is going wrong. Anyway, it, it, it uh, is true to history. And young kids coming along, they get to see uh, a progression of history of spaceflight, but, but they also see it mixed in with a very animated, uh, lively uh, 3D with, with flies going all over the place. And, uh, surprising the kids and they scream uh, this, <laughs> this is going to be a big hit uh, I'm convinced What's well, 3D why, too? why am I doing well I'm the only human being that uh, the real life human being that's in, in the whole film uh, I'm in the epilogue I kind of walk in and and uh, uh, say that uh, you know our spacecraft don't have flies really. <laughs> nice <laughs> it's, disclaimer it's called fly me to the moon it's uh, opening august 15th 3d film uh, premiering uh, august 15th and uh, you can also go to buzz aldrin that's a l d r i n uh, dot com and uh, it was so it was such an honor to have you and we're so happy you were able to come yeah to i have a non-profit share space dot org good and buzz aldrin dot com yeah we got to get you out of here you got to go do some tv buzz okay. this was a pleasure buzz aldrin everyone Attention, please. Station the virus. Sirius 197 XM 202.